Paul Moreland is a British demographer and author of the book No One Left Why the World Needs More Children. He was interviewed on one of my favorite philosophy channels Brain in a Bag. The subject of population was inevitable, but the interview started with a discussion about pronatalism and antinatalism. Now Paul is not a philosopher and it showed quite starkly from the poor answers that he had given to the benetarian arguments that the anchors had put forth to him. Paul really seemed to have little understanding of ethical issues of procreation. He's a demographer and so he has no problem viewing procreation just as a means to produce more labor or to serve the elderly or to solve the economic problems of one's country but on the demography side too he conveniently changed the tracks sometimes he would speak like he's solving the problems of the entire world at other he seemed like he was concerned only about a select few countries like the US and the UK where the fertility rates are really low he claimed that until we do something about it demographic collapse will happen in the near future and that is because people are not having enough children and on this topic the subject of immigration had to be brought up now we know that the fertility rates are declining almost all over the world but there are still some countries which have high fertility rates and if countries like the uk are falling short on labor then instead of procreating new humans why can't they utilize the services from already existing humans from other countries and here was his bizarre argument there's a moral issue which is why do we think we're too important and rich and busy to have children and we should uh, let women say in Ghana bear the bear the child bear the bear children bear the pains educate them bring them up educate them even to the level of being medical professionals which is a huge capital cost for a country like Ghana and then because we're busy and important we skim them off as we need them ship them in and uh, thank you very much um for your troubles even though we have massively more medical staff per capita in Britain than in Ghana so i think there is an ethical issue as well um immigration does not mean that countries like the uk set up factory farms producing humans in african countries it just means that people in high fertility countries who want to and are eligible to can move to the countries where they are needed and can contribute to the host countries meaningfully paul's argument also shows apathy towards those high fertility countries as if they can do whatever they want over there but i am going to demarcate the boundary of my demographics only around the economically developed countries while also pretending to be global about this issue as a demographer he would very well know that low fertility has a direct correlation with prosperity and increase in women's education and yet he thinks that people in prosperous countries should have more children and not let those from the poorer countries get the opportunity to improve and i'm not saying immigration is easy immigration brings with it loads of other problems one can be anti immigration for very valid reasons but when someone wants people to have more children to solve uh, society's economic problems while at the same time wants to build walls to stop existing people from moving around and to help low fertility countries that is where i think i disagree in benetar's words it is curious how democracy favors breeding over immigration offspring have a presumed right to citizenship while potential immigrants do not imagine a polarized state consisting of two opposing ethnic groups one increases its size by breeding and the other by immigration the group that grows by immigration will either be prevented from growing or it will be accused of colonialism but why should democracy favor one indigenous group over another merely because one breeds rather than increases by immigration why should breeding be unlimited but immigration curtailed where political outcomes are equally sensitive to both ways of enhancing population some may seek to answer this question by arguing that a right to procreative freedom is more important than a right to immigrate that may indeed be an accurate description of the way the law actually works but we can question whether that is the way it should be should somebody's freedom to create a person be more inviolable than somebody else's freedom to have a friend or family member immigrate another point to note was that in that interview they talked about many countries the us the uk they mentioned australia china sub saharan african countries israel japan korea south africa but remember the topic was procreation population and demographics but not once did paul mention the most populated nation on the planet 
India. And I'm not saying this because I happen to be from India. But this was like talking about all the important mountains and peaks in the world, but not mentioning Mount Everest even once. Also, Paul's dream of a young generation as a means to serve the elderly and all the balanced population pyramids are very well present in India. And yet, it is a country of a billion problems. And partly because of its population. Granted that the fertility rate in India also has come down to the replacement levels. But there are millions of young people who can't find jobs. Poverty, crime rates, women's safety issues, unemployable education, densely populated slums and cities, and an embarrassing wealth inequality are features of today's India, which is a demographic disaster. But that does not bother Paul at all. Now, I've not read his book. What I'm saying is only and only on the basis of this particular interview. So I might be totally wrong. And if that is the case, please let me know in the comments. From one demographer to another, University of Colorado had an interview of Leslie Root, who is actually worried about the rise of pronatalism. She's not an antinatalist either, but she goes into nuances of declining birth rates and the rise of pronatalism. She says pronatalism is not just the idea that people should have kids. It is the idea that we should engineer birth rates to hit certain targets for the good of society. It originated in the 1800s. We saw it again in Europe when they went through this postponement transition and we are seeing similar conversations in the US now. There's also this idea that we need to have growth from native birth rates rather than immigration. It worries me because we are seeing a weaponization of birth rates with some trying to pit people against each other based on whether they have kids or not. It's about shaming women who don't have kids and trying to get back to an era where having kids is obligatory for women to participate in society and it's all coming at a time when reproductive autonomy is under threat. Here's another article concerning pronatalism, this time from North Korea. The fertility rate of North Korea is also below the replacement level rate of 2.1. On paper, North Korea's fertility rate is 1.8, but unofficial figures estimate it might be as low as 1.3. So Kim and his kin are worried. They are arresting doctors for performing abortions and arresting those who are selling contraceptives. There is a growing black market of contraceptives in North Korea, which are illegally smuggled generally from China. It's a pretty grim article, even if you are not an antinatalist. Going from North Korea to Malaysia, there were two articles talking about child-free situations situation in Malaysia. One was on Malay Mail, which I think is a Malaysian website. And another one was on an Indian news website, ABP News, which was in Hindi. Malaysia is a Muslim majority country and there is a conflict in the traditional ways of viewing reproduction and the new generations who are not having children or enough children. Malaysia's Minister of Religious Affairs, Datuk Muhammad Naim Mokhtar, has said that being child-free is against Islamic principles. At the same time, the Minister of Family, Women and Community Development, Nancy Shukri, has defended couples' rights to remain child-free. So, there is a fierce debate going on in Malaysia about this issue right now, but all of that is framed within the religious context. Going from Malaysia to Indonesia, there were some um, articles in the media talking about how Pope visited Indonesia and he praised Indonesians for having four or five children instead of having dogs and cats. So we have this funny situation where Republicans, especially in America, are talking about immigrants eating dogs and cats, whereas Pope is going around the world asking people to have more children instead of having dogs and cats as pets, instead of taking care of dogs and cats. But anyway, that is all noise, not really directly into antinatalism, but just around the fertility on the periphery of the topics of antinatalism. So I thought I'll just mention that as a passing. Curiously, though, I looked up the fertility rates of Indonesia. They are also not like high as four and five. They are just above replacement level. I think it's about 2.15 or just thereabout. All right. So coming back from Indonesia to the UK, there was an article in Daily Mail about child-free versus child-bearing, rearing situations. This article again was not actually an antinatalist article, but I want to cover this for two reasons. One, aspect supporting child-free community helps normalize not having children. And two, Daily Mail is a right-wing conservative British media house and antinatalism usually gets a very strong resistance from right-wing. I'm not saying that left liberal folk are necessarily on the side of antinatalism. In fact, I have made a video responding to the leftist cook 
books and their pronatal nonsense. I'll put the link to that in the description if you want to check that out. Anyway, coming back to the Daily Mail article, this was written by a mother of four children. Her point was, since the fertility rates are declining all over the world, those who do have children are actually admired Politicians want women to have more children. That includes uh, Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping, um, Georgia Meloni, even those like, as we said, looked at Pope, Elon Musk. They want people to have more and more children to save the society from a demographic collapse. But here in this article, she says that having children actually makes you selfish. She takes her own example that before having children, she used to worry about the world, about the problems of the world. She would help others in the society. But now she cannot afford to do any of that. That's because she says any spare minute is devoted not to the greater good, but to the good of my household. This coming from a mother of four children in a British conservative newspaper is I think a big deal and a very good news. It is the right wing politicians who are usually accusing people who don't have children of being selfish. But here she says, when you're deep in the trenches of parenthood, selfless instincts are trampled underfoot. So yeah, good article. Hank Green. And if you don't know Hank Green, he's a famous YouTuber who generally makes videos about science. He made a YouTube short video talking about how bizarre it is that you can make a whole new person, a whole new human being just like that, even by accident. And inside the news, Lawrence is probably making a video about this soon. So looking forward to it. Talking of Lawrence, he made a video about the relationship between being glad to be born and the Stockholm Syndrome. Stockholm Syndrome is a coping mechanism where a captive person develops positive feelings towards their captor. In the natalist context, this provides analogy in two ways. One is that we feel glad to be born. We are born into captivity where we are slaves to our genes and the situation around us. And yet, we are glad to be here. And then there is this case of our parents who bring us here. In a way, they are our captors, but we develop one of the strongest bonds of love with them. Now, Lawrence focuses mainly on the situational part of it because talking about parent-child relationship in this context is not the healthiest approach. And I agree with him. I mean, talking about parent-child relationship is lot more complex than just talking about our genes and the situation. But it is still a topic that needs to be addressed, not in a hostile way, but in a philosophical way. David Benatar curiously dedicated his book Better Never To Have Been to his parents. We live in this web of relationships and among those relationships, our bonds with our parents are one of the strongest ones that we have, at least for some of us. And that is why I think this topic is very important and needs to be addressed. On a slightly different different shade of the same topic, Sophie Filia made a video talking about consent. I could consent to be born after I am born. But does that make the act of bringing me into this world before I could give that consent right? And to this, he gives some analogies like feeding me with some psychedelics without my consent to prove that it is still not right to do this without my consent, even if I might be enjoying that experience after I have had those psychedelics. So this is not a utilitarian argument. Um, if you make a rule that you ought not to impose something on someone without taking their consent first, then this argument works. And Sophie Filia goes quite into details of this. Radio Image is a Spanish channel with over 921,000 subscribers. And they had a discussion about antinatalism and uh, David Benatar. Since the video was in Spanish, I got the transcript translated. It looked like the speaker touched upon many aspects of Benatarian antinatalism, like the asymmetry, the quality of life argument, even talked about the human predicament, which is a separate book by David Benatar. And as usual, the host did not seem convinced but it is still a good news that antinatalism is being talked on these big channels. 